Uh, welcome everyone to the November meeting of the Philadelphia PowerShell User Group. Uh, I'm John Mello, the uh, one of the co-founders of the Philadelphia PowerShell User Group. Uh, one of the co-founders, Lido, couldn't make it today. Uh, TJ, you guys might have noticed, actually moved to North Carolina, so he will no longer be uh, presenting with us, and we'll hopefully wish him good luck uh, in his new endeavors. Um, today, actually, we're very, very excited to have uh, David Wilson uh, from the PowerShell team at Microsoft. Um, He's basically one of the software engineers there, um, very prolific in the actual blogging community as well. Um, definitely follow his Twitter feed and check out his blog when you get a chance. We'll put some links up for that. Um, and today he's going to be uh, giving a presentation called Creating PowerShell Projects with Plaster. Um, and from there, I'm going to hand it over to uh, David. All right. Thanks, John. Uh, so yeah, as John mentioned, I'm a developer on the PowerShell team. Um, and I'm mostly responsible for the development experience for PowerShell. So like you know, PowerShell ISC, uh, the PowerShell extension for Visual Studio Code, um, things like that. So uh, what I'll be talking about today is a new module that uh, Keith Hill and I have been working on called Plaster. And uh, a little bit of backstory about why Plaster came to be. Um, while we're developing the PowerShell extension for Visual Studio Code, we realized that it would be really nice to have a new project experience, sort of like how you have in Visual Studio, where you can just, you know, hit File, New Project, and then, you know, start filling in parameters so that you can create a new PowerShell module project or any other type of project that is really related to PowerShell. Um, but there's not like a built-in experience for that in VS Code. So uh, we talked to the VS Code team about this, and they recommended that we use this extension called VS Code Yo. I'm going to pull that up right now. Um, so this extension uses a Node.js based um, scaffolding tool called Yeoman. So basically what it allows you to do is create a new project and fill in some fields within VS Code, uh, and then your files get created and uh, put on the, on the file system, and then you can go from there. Uh, the problem with this is, like I said, is built on Node.js and uh, NPM. So what this will require for anybody in the PowerShell community is that you have Node.js installed, you have NPM installed, and you also install a package of PowerShell module templates that were created in JavaScript. So this really isn't um, ideal for the PowerShell community. So that's why we decided to make a solution that is more friendly to the PowerShell community and you know, it made sense to sort of write that in PowerShell. So uh, we created this project called Plaster, and we describe it on the GitHub repo as um, basically Plaster is yeoman for the PowerShell community. So if you go check out our GitHub repo at uh, github.com slash PowerShell slash Plaster, you'll find the code that we have so far. So this module hasn't actually been re released yet, um, or at least it hasn't been released officially. We've been developing it in the open for uh, probably since April of this year. Um, Keith Hill did the majority of the work, so he and I discussed the initial ideas for the project, and then he just sort of you know ran with it and uh, developed the initial prototype, and then uh, we sort of took it from there and sort of refined it over time and got a lot of really great feedback from the PowerShell community about what to do sort of to improve it and other use cases they may have for it. I think a lot of people have been using it already, even from the GitHub repo, just to you know create their own projects. I know a few people have have created templates. Uh, their own templates. Um, so, so far it's been pretty successful. Um, so really what we see for this is uh, for this to be the standard project creation experience uh, that goes beyond just what you can get from uh, new module manifest. So if you use new module manifest today, it just creates a PSD1 file for you. And um, you don't get any you know, module code, you don't get any tester tests, you don't get any kind of documentation or anything. But with Plaster, what we want to do is provide a default module project template that contains a lot of stuff that you might want to have and uh, makes it really easy for you to get started without having to assemble all, the, all of these details yourself. So um, what I'm going to show you today is how you can use Plaster to create a new PowerShell module from our default template. Then we'll also dig into how that template was made and then look at how you can create your own template uh, using Plaster. So, um, oh wow, I got a huge glare. Let me let me close this blind right quick. All right, 
that's not going to work. Anyway, so um, like I said, this project is uh, not fully released yet. So the things that I showed you today may be a little bit rough, um, especially because I haven't had a lot of time to prepare for this due to a lot of things going on. But uh, we'll do the best we can. Um, so first, let's just show you what it could look like to use Plaster inside of Visual Studio Code. So I'm in um, VS Code Insiders right now. Uh, just there because I'm using it to develop uh, the next version of the PowerShell extension. And I'm going to run uh, a new command that I added in the command palette called uh, new PowerShell project. And what this will do is um, call into PowerShell and launch Plaster so that uh, Plaster can be used to create the new uh, project files and then we can open the folder and, and start looking into them. So I will go ahead and run that command. And first, it's asking me for a destination path. So this is the output folder for the module that we create. So I'll say C dev, um, let's see, I can call it my, uh, one second, we have a little bit of a issue. OK, my new module. OK, so now. We're creating a uh, module into that path, and you can see that we've got the nice little plaster banner here. And now it's asking me for the uh, the name of the module. Oh, by the way, can you guys see the text and everything on the screen okay? Uh, yeah, everyone here is it okay? Yep. yep, we're good. Actually, the black background of the Visual Studio Code actually makes it easier than the regular ISC to see. Great. Cool. So uh, let's get back to it. Uh, we have uh, enter the name of the module. So I'm just going to say, you know, my new module. And it's asking me to enter a description of the module. Um, so I'll just say this is my new module. And it asks me for a version number. And it has a default uh, version number here specified. We could say 1.0.10 if we want. Um, also, it asks me for my full name. And amazingly, it already knows what my full name is. Uh, I'll go into that a little bit later. But um, for now, we'll just accept the, um, the current value. And it also asks me to select an open source license if I want one. So uh, we have Apache and MIT and none. So I'm just going to pick Apache here. And then um, this UI is not so great. We'll fix that up. But it's uh, asking me for one or more tooling options. So this is uh, one of the cooler parts of the default template where we have some options for things that we can include into your template if you want. So like things like a git ignore file or a build script using sake, uh, pester tests, um, some configuration for PS script analyzer, and also um, the ability to generate documentation using Platypus. So I'm going to go ahead and just pick the git ignore and the sake build script and uh, pester tests, of course. And Platypus. So we'll skip the script analyzer support for now. And then now that I'm happy with my choices, I'll just go ahead and hit enter to confirm. And now it finally asks me, uh, what's my uh, code editor? So it can generate any kind of files that are necessary for your code editor of choice. So since I use VS Code, I'll just select that. And now it says it's scaffolding my module. And you can see it has a lot of output here, giving you all the files that are being created. And um, also it tells you that it's looking for the modules that the um, your sort of developer dependencies for your modules to make sure that they're there. Checks for, for Pester version 3.4.0, sees it there. It sees that Saki is installed. But it sees that Platypus is not the minimum required version. So within your, um, uh, your templates, you can actually specify that you need to have a specific, or I guess at least a minimum version of a module uh, before this module can be used. Uh, or b before your new module can be used, or the new project can be used. Um, this is not a hard restriction, because you, as you can see, the files get created anyway. But it tells you this just in case, so that you know that um, the project won't work until you install these dependencies. In the future, we might provide some way to make it easier for you to just confirm the installation of, the, of those dependencies at the time that you create the project. But uh, the reality is that if you commit this code to Git and share it with someone else, then uh, you're still going to have the problem that they may not have the right dependencies. So, um, you know, Plaster can't solve this problem for, for all the consumers of the project you create, just, just for you as you create it. 
Um, anyway, it uh, gives you some more details here about the project that got created. Um, it said that a pester test has been created, et cetera. It gives you a little bit of information on how you can run those tests in VS Code. Um, it tells you you can generate help and documentation, blah, blah, blah. So basically, it, you know, we created all of, our fi all of our files. It gave us some information about, you know, how we can use them. Um, so that's cool. Now let's go ahead and try to open the project that got created so we can take a look at the files. So I will open my new module. And we can see that uh, we have a bunch of stuff here. Um, we have like a release notes file that uh, kind of is a nice starting point. Uh, script analyzer settings, which this shouldn't be created if script analyzer is not being used, but uh, we'll look into that. Um, we have the build script, obviously, and uh, we start off with just like a top level build script. And um, we're just invoking sake and we're, we're calling into this build.sake.ps1. And this is sort of the meat and potatoes of the default module template. This is a pretty big uh, build script that has a few different tasks, like cleaning, building, signing, building the documentation, installing the module in your local uh, uh, PS module path, uh, running tests, and also publishing to the PowerShell gallery. So um, I highly recommend if you go and create a new project based on this template, you should go through and look at all the documentation here because it's pretty extensively documented. Also tells you how you can invoke the script using sake, et cetera. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of stuff in here, and I'm not going to go through all the details because you can sort of do that on your own time. It'd be more interesting that way. But um, yeah, there's a lot of thought been put into this script, and um, we're still not completely done with it yet. We've done a lot of stuff that we wanted to do, but um, before we get the first official release of Plaster out, we want people to, to give us feedback about sort of the process we're using here, the task we have, if there's anything else that we're missing, or maybe um, some more flexibility we could add to the script. Um, so it'd be really great if you guys, if you decide to use a project, please come to our GitHub page and file issues for anything that you think should be added or changed. So um, one interesting thing is that we have this build.settings.ps1 file. Um, now, you may notice we have three different build files here. And the reason we did it this way is so that the build.saki.ps1 file only has the task information in it. So it doesn't have to be edited by the user. It's just completely self-contained, uh, doesn't ever have to be touched. Uh, build.ps1 is sort of the entry point for just building your project. That doesn't really need to be touched either unless you want to. The thing that you might make changes to is this build.settings.ps1 file. And it has a bunch of properties that have been defined in the Saki uh, property system, basically, so that you can change a lot of the defaults that we've set. So let's say the default locale of your documentation generation, you can set that to a different language than English if you want. Um, you can change the path that your, um, your files get built and um, saved to before you publish or release to the gallery. Uh, you can change the, the root directory of your source and your test and documentation files. You basically change everything. So um, we sort of made it like this so that we can have a default template that can work for most people. And then if you have some special case um, configuration that you need to do for your own project, then you can just change these settings in this file to be whatever you want. So let's see if there's anything else interesting here. Um, you know, things like your API key for publishing to the PowerShell gallery. Um, let's see. We also have these uh, pre and post build steps. So what these do is um, since we have our build.saki.ps1 file sort of you know, hard coded, um, we have provided these hooks so that for each of our major build tasks, you can do a pre and post step for those build tasks so that you can add your own custom logic. So if you look in the build.saki.ps1 file, you can see that task build depends on the build implementation task, which does some stuff. Uh, and also it has post build um, as a task. So after build runs, it will run post build. And also the build implementation depends on pre build. And actually, maybe this is not what I think it is. Ah, yeah, the way the build is set up is it depends on build implementation, which is the, you know, the meat of the build operation. And then it does post build afterwards. So, um, 
you can you can override or actually you can add something to this post build step or the pre build step to do custom logic if you have a particular need. Uh, one thing that might be the case for you is if you have um, C sharp code that's part of your module that you need to build, you could add some uh, calls into MS Build or .NET or anything like that in um, the pre build task so that uh, all of your source code gets built before your module gets compiled. So um, let's see, is there anything else that's interesting here? I think that's it. So yeah, it's, it's pretty flexible so far. Uh, I highly recommend that uh, anybody who's interested in creating a new PowerShell project, try to use this template, see if it works for you. Um, I think that uh, you might find that it, it does a pretty good job of uh, covering most of the, the common cases of things that you might need in your uh, module development. So some of the more, uh, some of the other interesting things we can see. So we have a the documentation folder. So um, we're going we're using Platypus, which is a project that the PowerShell team released a few months back, which allows you to write your uh, module documentation using Markdown. So you can see that you've got this docs folder that has the uh, the about file for the module. So you can go fill this information in, and uh, that will form the basis of your. Um, your module documentation, and we've got uh, some tasks here for building the docs, so uh, that will call into Platypus and do everything for you. Um, we have some default uh, tester tests, and uh, we have some module manifest tests, which you know is sort of like a, a free test that gives you the ability to call test module manifest to make sure that your uh, module manifest doesn't have any uh, invalid syntax. Um, and we have the share.ps1 file, which handles um, doing the import of your module for you, which can be helpful if you have multiple test files and each of them need to import the module before they, they go further. Um, yeah, we have our license file, which is the Apache license, as we had selected before. The source folder doesn't really have much. It just has your PSD1 file that um, has all the details for the module that got created. Also has effectively a blank PSM1. It just has ex export module number here. Um, we also have some default tasks for Visual Studio Code, and this is actually kind of nice because it defines the um, the clean task, the build task, build help, an analysis task, which isn't completely necessary because we have built-in script analyzer support. Um, uh, pretty much all the tasks that we export in, or yeah, that we support in our uh, build.sucky.ps1 file are here. Um, we also have the ability to run tests, which gives you um, uh, markup or, or problem matchers for the test output. So let me actually try to run a task right now. So if I hit Control Shift P and type task, the tasks run task action, and uh, let me just go and run the tests. So if I run that, it invokes Pester. And basically, just ran my tests in the output window here, told me everything's fine. So if I go into my uh, new uh, my PSD1 file, let's uh, just mess it up a little bit and see what happens if I run the test again. Um, and I can actually do this run test task. I think this works. So now it runs Pester, and now we got an error basically saying that. Um, our module manifest is uh, is not right, and I think I can click on these links. Yeah. Completely line up it. Either way, you can click a link to go to the file. Um, so we've got all this stuff sort of wired up for you, which is nice. Uh, you can also do things like uh, the build task. So uh, run build task, which is also bound to Control Shift B. In most cases, you know, people who are writing PowerShell modules that are only PowerShell don't need to run build because there's nothing to build, but you know, if you do have something wired up to your build tasks, then you can use Control Shift B to um, turn your build really easily. It's kind of nice. Um, let's see if okay. New external help. Ah, right, because I don't have the right um, uh, version of Platypus installed, this is not going to work. Anyway, the point is. Uh, we do have a fully functional module project here, and it's a great starting point for anyone who wants to create a new module. Um, so definitely check it out and let us know if you have any feedback about um, specific um, details that maybe could be improved or changed. Does anybody, anybody have a question about the module so far before we move on? 
questions? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I've got um, the GUID that you, I, I assume you generate a GUID that's not hard coded. So, so each time you run this thing, you're going to get a, a, a unique GUID? Yeah, um, so I'll look at that whenever we start looking at the, the template that produced this uh, project. So I think that uh, it's always a unique good. Okay. Any other questions? Anything else? No, we're good right now. We can continue. Thank you. Cool. All right, so um, let's go ahead and look at the, um, the template files for this. All right, so um, I'm looking at the, I'll actually show you where this folder is. So inside of uh, the plaster source, uh, you can go into the source folder and then um, templates. And then we have uh, a new DSC resource uh, script template, and we also have the new module template. So I'll select a folder for a new module. And um, everything in plaster is driven around the plaster manifest.xml file. So this is basically a file that contains all the information about what uh, parameters the template um, requires that the user enter, or um, the files that are included with the template. Um, pretty much all of the metadata, everything else that you need is, is in this one file. Everything else that you see inside of this folder structure are the source files for the template. So they're being used by this manifest file to create the new module. So. Um, we can look at uh, the metadata first. We have a schema version. So as we continue to rev the schema for this specific, temp uh, actually, rev the schema for Plaster itself, uh, the XML schema, uh, we'll continue to change this version. But uh, as soon as we declare 1.0, we're going to have 1.0 on our schema. And then from that point forward, we shouldn't have any breaking changes. So until then, we're still you know, trying to finalize everything. But I think that Keith is pretty happy with um, the state of things at the moment. So. Um, you can see that we have the ID for the uh, the template itself. Um, we have the name of the template, the title of the template that is displayed to the user, description, version. So uh, template versions are uh, kind of useful because in the future we may actually have um, template inheritance. So you may have like a base template um, that's like a common template that is shared by different uh, projects, and then you can have a template that uh, inherits from the template and then adds some extra stuff to it. Um, we still haven't decided completely whether we're going to do that yet, but it's a possibility, so it's kind of nice to have these versions so that we can use that for our version constraints. Also have a set of tags for the template. Um, and then we start defining this block of parameters. And these are all the parameters that you will be um, asked to fill in whenever you run this template using the invoke plaster commandlet. So uh, here we have the module name, and you see that it actually has a prompt for you know, enter the name of the module. So pretty much all these are just you know normal text entry fields, um, and you can define defaults for those parameters as well. And this full name, and this is the full name um, parameter that actually figured out what my name was whenever it was asking me the questions. Uh, the reason why that works is it has this store parameter, and um, one of the nice features of Plaster is that we have the concept of a, a parameter store. And this is a file that's stored locally on your machine in your uh, user profile. And it stores common parameter names for, or sorry, common uh, parameter values for a template. So if you run this new module template a lot, whenever you put in your name the first time, it will store it because store equals text is, is set here so that any future invocations of the same template will preserve those values and then use them again. So it allows you to easily set defaults for um, your template so that you know you can quickly bang through a new project if you need to um, without having to just type everything in manually. So um, also we can do things like uh, encrypting um, keys or passwords. We use the at least on Windows we use the DP API. I guess secure string basically whatever. I, I don't know the details of how Keith wrote it, but basically we can encrypt the data into your store so that if you have like a new API key, then it can be used in the store. Um, so that's kind of nice. Also have the ability to do choice parameters. So here we have the license parameter that allows you to select between the various licenses that you might want. Um, so you can see that we're defining each choice that has a label, um, the description text, and also the value. Um, so in PowerShell, in the normal PowerShell prompt, this should show up to you as the uh, prompt for input or prompt for choice, I think, is the, uh, the host API. 
but it basically just gives you the list of options to choose from, and you can pick one of them. Um, there's also a multi-choice parameter type, which means um, you should be able to select multiple of these options before moving forward. So this allows us to do this thing where we have the options for pester and platypus and script analyzer, et cetera. Uh, similar to the, the, uh, the single choice items above, you still have the label and the help string and all that. So I think that's it for parameters uh, in this template. I don't see anything else that looks unique. So um, now we get to the content section. And this section defines what, um, what files will be uh, put into the destination path as part of the template creation process. So um, in the content thing, basically um, everything in this list gets run in order. And you can use the uh, message element to write a message out to the user. So we're basically saying we're scaffolding your PowerShell module. And then we have the new module manifest uh, tag. And this, is, this element is specific for the creation of a new module manifest. And this is how we uh, are able to create a manifest that has a unique GUID because we're actually using new module manifest directly as part of the, uh, the creation step here. So we can see the destination of the PSD1, the module version, author description, encoding, et cetera. Uh, you can specify whether you want to have UTF-8 with a bomb or without a bomb, which can be problematic for people at times. So uh, we have some default stuff there. Um, and also, you can have individual files that get copied um, without any templatization. So if you want to copy a file, like, let's say, uh, all the build files. So we're using the, um, the glob for build star here to say all the build files, just copy them over um, directly. So we copy from a source location, which is rel relative to the um, directory where the plaster manifest is stored. And then we have destination, which if you don't provide a subpath, then it just puts it right into the root of the destination path that the user specified when they ran the template. Um, you can also specify a condition. And you can see here that uh, we have a special syntax for plaster parameters. So um, inside of the session where we're running the template, um, this is a normal PowerShell variable, and this is a normal PowerShell um, operator, so contains. Um, so we're looking for the options parameter um, to have sake as one of the items in the, uh, the variable of that uh, parameter. So if it has that, if the condition returns true, then we're going to actually do the file copying. Otherwise, we're not going to copy the files. And I believe that's why the script analyzer settings got dropped here, even though uh, we did not select script analyzer because there's no condition here. So we need to fix that. Uh, let's see. So yeah, that's all really simple stuff. We're just copying files, basically. Now we get to the more interesting part where we have files that are being templated. So um, same syntax as before. We have a source and destination. We have a condition. Um, the difference, though, is that these files, like about module.help, uh, that markdown, we could check this out in the docs folder. You'll see that there are these little template strings. And uh, it's a normal markdown file, but we have these the special syntax where let me make this a little bit bigger, where um, you can insert the value of a parameter that was passed into the template. So here we're saying we want to use the module name as the first level header in the file, and then also write out the about module name as the second level header of the file, which I think is part of the uh, the, the platypus syntax for markdown. And I think that's it in this file. But the idea is that um, for any template file entry in the plaster manifest, um, whenever it takes the file to be copied to the destination path, it's going to try to evaluate any of these um, these template strings and then you know put your content into the file. So this allows you to have some files that get some generated content in them. Um, and this file also seems to have a similar uh, template string, which is nice. So if we go back here, um, the, these are all pretty much the same. Um, so you can also set the destination using a parameter. So you can see that we're using the uh, module name for uh, setting the, the destination path of some files. So we're using the module.t.ps1, which I think is sort of a, um, a convention we're using to denote a file that's being have, having its name templated. Um, and we're going to write it out to be the um, the right folder path. Actually, let me see. 
pull it up right quick. Yeah, so in the docs folder, you can see that this file is called about my new module that help because we're pulling that from the, uh, the template parameter. So um, any file that you create can have its name templated as well. Um, yeah, we have more files being copied, and um, you can also see that we do more complex logic for parameters. So we say that if the editor is VS Code and um, the options doesn't contain Saki, and um, the options contains pester, then we want to copy um, a specific version of the task.json file to .vs code slash task.json. Uh, let's see, where is that file? Editor, uh, VS code. Yeah, so we have three different versions of, the, of these files. And um, we're doing this because there are some configurations of the module where you don't want to have all the details there. So we're trying to sort of scope it down to a, a per file level. There may be a better way to do this, but uh, this seemed to be the most expedient way to do it for now. So if you have any particular ideas or feedback on the method we're using for having sort of different versions of a file um, be created based on a variety of different options, definitely let us know. Um, I guess the, the more, most common question is why can't we just run PowerShell code to generate these template files? Um, well, really the main concern is that we would have uh, a malicious template that could just run whatever code it wanted, you know, delete your user profile folder or do any other malicious activity, install ma malware, et cetera. So we're trying to restrict the amount of PowerShell script execution that happens when, it's, uh, when a template gets run. Uh, Keith actually use, uses um, constrained sessions, I think, to make it so that you can run these um, Boolean operations but not actually run other things uh, as part of the template. So. There, I think there's some other commands he actually enabled, um, but it's, it's a very scoped down set because we want to make sure that nobody gets anything weird happening on the machine. So uh, we also have the ability to, to specify modules that are required by different option, or by different um, things in the template. So we'll say require module named pester, and the condition is that if the user selected the pester option, then we do require this module. Uh, we specify the minimum version of Pester, and uh, we give a message that gets written out if you don't have that version installed. So this is how you say that if you use this template, then the output files are going to require a certain set of modules with a certain specific minimum version. So now we're down to the final messages, and you can even write out messages based on conditions as well. So uh, we don't write out the Pester message unless you have selected the Pester option in the template. Um, let's see if there's anything else here. Yeah, and you can use uh, the parameter variables inside of the messages as well, so that's helpful for writing out details. I was pretty sure that we had a command in here somewhere, like calling like get date or something, but I don't see it at all, so maybe that's, that's not represented here. But anyway, um, does anyone have any questions on the template so far or sort of the features that I've showed you um, uh, inside of the manifest? No questions locally here. I'm sorry? Oh, no, no questions here in the office. Cool. So um, another question that we get asked about uh, the manifest is, uh, why don't we write the manifest as a PSD1 file? Um, well, there's one specific reason for that, or I guess there's two reasons for that. One is um, in editors, it's very common that you can get IntelliSense for the XML file based on the schema that's being used. So as you see here, we actually have a schema specified for uh, for plaster. And because of this, uh, editors generally have the ability to give you uh, IntelliSense. I don't think that we're getting IntelliSense from VS Code right now. Maybe it's because I don't have a certain setting turned on or something. But I mean, you can see I'm getting IntelliSense, but it's because that word exists inside of the file elsewhere. So it just uh, it picks it up. But, um, that's one reason. The other, the other nice reason here is that the schema validation code that exists in .NET makes it really easy, easy for us to validate this schema, or sorry, validate manifest files based on our schema without having to do a bunch of manual logic ourselves. So that was the main reason for using XML to begin with. We didn't want to use JSON but because of similar reasons. Um, I mean, JSON has some libraries that can do schemas, but um, they're not as good as XML schemas, and XML typically is more expressive uh, data format. Um, now, as far as PSD1s are concerned, 
uh, I think in PSD ones you can run PowerShell code, and we wanted to avoid that. So uh, we may go back to that idea in the future, or we may try to do like a PowerShell based DSL or something. But um, for now, we're pretty happy with the XML schema as it is, or the XML based manifest format. So if the community um, wants to move to a different option, then we're definitely happy to talk about it and try to find a good middle ground. And if our concerns about security, about um, whether templates will do something malicious, if our concerns are sort of um, a little bit too, I wouldn't say paranoid, but if they're too uh, stringent, let us know, because if people don't really care about that, then you know we might be able to relax on that stuff. But for now, at least for 1.0, I think we're going to stick with the XML-based manifest format, because it's, it's been working pretty well so far. Um, I think that's everything for that. So um, let me show you how to create a new template from scratch. So I go to um, my PowerShell prompt. I pulled Plaster from GitHub, so I'm, I've basically got a Plaster repo here. Um, and I'm in the source slash templates folder. I'm just here because it's easy to, to, to do it, um, or easy for the purpose of example. But you can see that we have the new module folder and the new DSC resource group folder. So I can just see the files there. So I'll create a new folder called my template. Go to that folder. Then I will use the new plaster manifest uh, uh, command line. Oops. So uh, you can see that we can create a new plaster manifest. I think my video card driver just crashed. Can you still hear me? Yeah, it's still here. We see a little bit of the video. It looks like it just uh, did one of those like black screen refreshes. Yeah, very nice. Uh, let me pull this back up. Anyway, whatever. So, um, so we have new plaster manifest. Uh, we say what the path is for the manifest file, the name of the the uh, the template. Uh, you can specify the ID of the template, but if you don't specify that, then we just generate a, a GUID for you. Uh, the version of the template, title, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Pretty much all the main metadata parameters can be set using this. Um, this command list. So if I call a new plaster manif manifest, whoops. Um, I'll just call it blank. Uh, so my template. All right. So we'll, we just have a plaster manifest XML here. So if I go and uh, create a new window and open my template, then we'll see that we have just a plain plaster manifest here. And we have our ID that got generated on the fly. We have our name, version, uh, the, the title itself, my cool template. Um, all right, so we can define a parameter. And because I'm lazy, I'm just going to copy and paste. Um, come on. The extension is not playing very, very nicely right now. OK, so uh, first param. We'll, we'll just name this parameter first param because I'm not very creative at the moment. Uh, actually, yeah, let's see the text there. And um, let's say enter the first parameter. Let's not call it first param. Let's see. Uh, OK, so now I have a parameter. And I want to create a content file that, can, that this parameter can be used with. So let's create a new file. I'm going to say write host. This is the syntax. All right, let's try that. 
And uh, we need to specify the content file. So I'm going to say this is a template file. I think that's right. Template file. And let's steal the string as well. Actually, I'll just type it in. Course equals uh, templated script dot ps1 destination equals empty string because we just want to put it in the top level path uh, where the template lives. Is um, I think that's everything for the basics. So let's try to run this. I'll see in book plaster. And I'll give it uh, more fun. Uh, I also want to make, make an output directory. Um, one thing that uh, we do in Plaster is if you don't have the destination path already created, we throw an error. Um, yeah, let me actually show you that, because if you think it's not, uh, if, you, if you think it's bad user experience, we need to do something about it. But uh, Let's try to run plaster, uh, invoke plaster, and we'll say my template. So we're just basically going to say uh, we're invoking plaster with the template path being my template. Let's see, is it? There we go, template path. All right, destination path. We'll just say out. All right. Oh, why did it run? It shouldn't run. <laughs> anyway, enter the output string, hello world. Okay, so in our folder, we have templated script. If we, if we cat the file, templated script, we'll see we have write host hello world. So we've created um, a new file from our really simple plaster manifest and our templated script. And it's interesting that it has an extra space in there. I'm a little concerned about that. I run that again, and we'll force that so that it overrides the file. Uh, Okay, so uh, that's great, um, and we can really quickly try to do a file that may or may not be included. So let's say optional script, yeah. and um, do a choice parameter, name equals uh, optional file, type equals choice, Close the parameter. Let's go check the choice here so that we can save a little bit of time. All right. So, yes. And no. Now we may need to add a um, faster way to do yes and no questions in the template. Uh, I'll see if I can figure out a way for us to provide that. And okay. So I think that's everything for the optional file. Uh, we can also specify a default value. So let's say that the default is uh, one because we want the um, on a zero base scale, zero to zero is yes, one is no. So we want no to be the default. So we'll put that there. Um, and I think that's it for that one. So if we go to this area and say file edition ram. Uh, optional file equals uh, yes. Basically, done our condition here, and we'll say the source file is one, and the destination is just a string. I'll also close that out. I think that's enough. So let's try to run that again. 
David, both your label choices, both your choice labels are yes, are AMP yes. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Thanks for catching that. Let me try that again. All right, enter the output stream. Hello world. Okay, now it says include the file, yes or no. And we can see that the uh, the no is the default. Uh, so I'll just leave it no. And we can see that uh, templated script is written out. Um, also, you can notice that it says that the file is identical. So uh, one of the things about Plaster that we wanted to uh, make possible is you should be able to run a template on a folder more than once, and it should be non-destructive. So if you run a template on a folder and the file's already there and it hasn't been changed, then it, it just won't bother with it. Uh, it, won't, it won't change it again. Um, so this might be useful in the future if we update our default project templates and you want to go and update your project that was created based on that template. Uh, you, theor in theory, you should be able to go and uh, run the template again on your project folder and then not have it completely destroy your project. Um, we need to, to make sure that's actually the case, uh, so don't go try that now uh, unless you're, uh, you know, uh, looking for some fun. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, we can see that um, in the output folder, the optional script is not there. So if I go and run invoke plaster again, and this time I'll say something different. Uh, then we'll say yes for including the file. And now you can see that it created the optional script. So if we look in the output folder, then the optional script file is there. Um, so that's that's pretty much the process. I mean, it's, it's not very uh, complicated. You just, you know, you have your set of files that you want to create as part of your template. Um, some of the things can be conditional. Um, some of the things can be stored in parameters that you've used before. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty straightforward. So if you want to learn more about how to use uh, or how to write a plaster template, we've got some really good documentation started for that. So um, after Keith and I had been working on uh, the project for a while, or I guess I, I should say after Keith had been working on the project for a while, uh, another guy named Dave Green came along and helped us to get a few more of our tasks going, like our script analyzer task and some code cover stuff. Um, and also, he helped write a, a ton of documentation for this current state that we're at. So um, definitely go take a look at the documentation we have for creating a plaster manifest. Uh, basically explains all the parameters, all of the sections, and some considerations you may have to make if you're designing a template. Um, and we also have general commandlet uh, help here as well. So the, the invoke plaster help, et cetera. So basically, you know, we should have a fully documented model by the time we release our 1.0. So uh, if you're interested in using Plaster, definitely go check out the documentation folder because all that's there on the GitHub repo, and this is, this is all public. Um, let's see, is there anything else I wanted to cover? Uh, the VS Code integration that I showed earlier is, I literally wrote it this morning. Uh, it's not ready yet, and it, my, my, my goal is to have it in the next release of the extension, which is uh, 0 0.8. Um, that should be coming within the next couple of weeks. I keep saying it should be coming in the next couple of weeks, and it keeps not happening. Uh, the main reason is because I've been working really hard to try to get um, a fully integrated console for PowerShell working, and uh, I keep hitting issues with that. So I'm just going to put that off and try to get a new release out that has Plaster integration and some other nice new stuff. So uh, within the next few weeks, you should see a new update to um, the extension that can use Plaster. So if you try to use it to create new projects, definitely um, let us know on either the Plaster repo or the, uh, the VS Code PowerShell repo. Let's see if I can pull that up real quick. Yeah, the, uh, the VS Code PowerShell repo. And just, you know, file issues for anything that doesn't seem to be working right, or um, if you have any ideas for things that we can improve. Um, yeah, so uh, that's pretty much it for Plaster. Um, if anybody has questions about Plaster, I'm happy to, to answer them. Or if you have questions about the PowerShell extension for Visual Studio Code or anything else that uh, that I might know something about, uh, feel free to ask. Anybody have any questions? He's got a default template in there for DSC resources as well, right? Uh, do you have Sorry. that? What was that? Oh, um, you showed us a template default in the code for creating a module. You, you have one in there for DSC resources, right? I think yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Yeah. Let's let's look at it real quick because I I haven't actually uh, played with that one at all. Um, let's see. <coughs> Source. Okay. All right. So this seems to be a really simple template, um, and it looks like we're creating um, some get and set and test methods for a resource. Um, yeah, this one's pretty basic. But uh, if you have particular ideas for what might be good as a default template for uh, a DSC resource, definitely let us know on the Plaster repo because we haven't really thought through that one very much yet. Um, I, I'm not an expert in DSC. Um, I think Keith may have, be, have used it more than I have. So uh, definitely we would love to have some, some some full requests and just some issues with some information about what you might want to see for a, a DSC resource template. Um, and anything else that might be a good sort of default template um, that or is a pretty common thing that you might want to create for PowerShell, let us know so that we can have that as part of the default distribution. Any other questions? So um, there's one other thing that I forgot to mention, um, and I don't have it to show right now, but um, whenever we have Plaster out, um, one thing that we need to, to be able to provide is a distribution mechanism for plaster templates because, you know, it's, it doesn't make sense to write a whole module to do templatization of projects if we don't make it so that everybody can make their own templates and distribute them. So currently the, uh, the plan is to allow templates to be distributed through the PowerShell gallery. And the way that we're going to do this is um, you can publish a normal PowerShell module to the gallery and as part of your PSD1 file, you can put some extra metadata in the private data section that says that, th that your module contains plaster templates and just basically points it to like a subfolder inside your module. And if you have that metadata there, uh, plaster, whenever the user tries to enumerate the templates that are on their machine, uh, plaster will go and look into the user's uh, PS module path to see if there's any installed modules that have plaster metadata in them. That way, um, a user can go and install like a new module that contains a few templates. Maybe it's uh, uh, templates for a, a particular project or something like that. Then you should be able to go and, and create new projects and files based on uh, those distributed templates. So one way that this could be useful is if you create a new uh, PowerShell module and um, people are supposed to write code using your module instead of just using it in the console, you might want to create Plaster templates to go along with your module and ship them with the module so that a user can then use Plaster to create new uh, projects based on uh, the usage of your model. Or maybe just files, because Plaster is also capable of creating just files and not an entire project. Um, so um, in VS Code, the way this is going to work is if you say, you know, new PowerShell project or maybe new PowerShell file, um, we will enumerate the templates on the system and then show you a list of all the templates that you have, including the default templates. So it should just be like an auto-discovery thing where if uh, the user installs a module that has templates, then they will get the, uh, the uh, template to show up in VS Code whenever they try to create something. So it should be really uh, a really smooth user experience. Um, we're going to have that in the first release, I hope. Um, I mean, that's a plan for, for right now. So uh, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. But uh, yeah, be, be on the lookout for that. Any other questions? Actually, David, I have, um, if you don't mind, I have actually a few questions uh, around the IC and uh, Visual Studio Code, if you have a few moments. Sure. So, actually, it's funny because I didn't actually put two and two together until, like, I was actually, we just started this. So, um, actually, guys, David was on the uh, episode 311 of the Power Scripting Podcast, gave actually a great history of the uh, genesis of Visual Studio Code, um, basically um, almost the state of the union of the IC, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and of the IntelliSense plugins. Uh, any updates since then? Uh, I know at the time, that I think right around that time was the release of the .5.0 5 um, preview version of the ISC. Um, I haven't heard much about it since then. And it, it obviously seems that the Visual Studio Code is like the way forward in regards to a Microsoft provided uh, PowerShell integrated scripting uh, editor. Um, is that still the case? 
That's a great question. Um, so yeah, uh, I feel kind of bad because I haven't updated the ISC preview in a long time. Um, I had done a lot of improvements to it earlier this year that never got completed, uh, mainly because the cross-platform stuff um, sort of came became a big priority in sort of the middle part of the year, around May, I think, May or June. And um, I had a lot of work to do to make the PowerShell extension work cross-platform, uh, which basically meant, you know, using the new um, cross-platform PowerShell. And I had to do some major refactoring of uh, PowerShell editor services, which is the, the core language server, debugging server for VS Code and other editors. And also, like, we wanted to try to support Sublime Text as another editor that can use uh, PowerShell editor services. So there's all this work that was happening around the middle of the year. And uh, because of all that, there was just no work being done on the IC preview whatsoever. So uh, we haven't decided yet when we'll get back to that, just because there's still more things we need to do. Like right now, the big thing is to try to get the um, interactive console experience in VS Code working well because, you know, we want to have the same ISC level experience in the PowerShell extension for VS Code and make it cross-platform so that um, we have a really great editing experience for all three supported platforms. Uh, once that's done, then we might have time to go back and try to, you know, invest more in the ISC preview. But for now, uh, the VS Code is the, the sort of the primary area where I'm spending my time. So. Uh, uh, we're trying to get to like a 1.0 release of the uh, PowerShell extension probably around March of next year or, you know, sometime in the first or second quarter of next year just to get like a really stable experience there. And once we're done with that, then we can figure out what else we need to do. So, um, yeah, for now, uh, the best thing you can do um, if you're an ISE fan, just keep using ISE because, you know, that it's, it's the same as it, as it is. Um, if you are interested in using VS Code but you feel like the PowerShell extension isn't fully there for you yet. Um, continue to, to check out the new updates that I release. I always tweet out whenever there's a new update. Um, and, and give it a shot and see if the experience is getting better for you because we want to make it really good to the point where, you know, you, you could use VS Code if you wanted to in, instead of using the ISC. But, <clears throat> uh, but yeah, just, just let me know if, uh, if there's things that are missing. I, there, there's some, some common issues right now that are all logged on the GitHub issues page. All, all things I'm going to get handled at some point soon here. But, uh, but yeah, most of my effort is getting that experience to be really solid because we want to try to reach out to people on Linux, basically. Like people who are on the Linux platform who use that for their day to day, you know, cloud computing work, et cetera. Uh, we want to make sure that those people can also be productive using PowerShell. So that's sort of why a lot of the effort has been spent in that area uh, in the last few months. Cool, no, thanks. And I was by no means trying to berate you on the... About oh, no, that. yeah. Because it, um, it definitely makes sense um, in the recent announcement over the past like month or so of PowerShell, you know, going open source and everything. Um, that, like, looking at it back net now, it's like, okay, that's the reason why so much effort was put towards getting the PowerShell editor services and Visual Studio Code up the snub as opposed to putting more um, development into the um, IC 5.0 preview, which makes a lot of sense because um, the more you can get done, as you said, for the open source platform, that works for everything. And I know personally, the only thing I've, so we did a presentation like right around that when you guys announced that of Visual Studio Code and it has drastically um, improved um, its PowerShell experience since it's been introduced. It seems like almost every release is almost like, wow, you guys are doing a lot of work on this. Um, the interactive council console is the one thing that does hold me back from using it all the time compared yeah. to um, having the ISE open. But um, so far, like I love it a lot. I just want to love it enough so it becomes my primary. Um, and I don't know how everyone else feels about it in regards to I'm getting a lot of head nods uh, in regards to that. Um, but I know a lot of people who are strictly like Visual Studio developers or you know, .NET and C developers who also dabble in PowerShell, like instantly gravitated towards um, Visual Studio Code for it because obviously it was a perfect extension to what they're already used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I'm waiting for that uh, interactive console myself just because uh, there, there's just something about the ISC where you pop into the ISC and you can really easily write some script out and test it real fast. and. Um, that's just, I mean, you can sort of do that in uh, VS Code right now with the PowerShell extension, but it's just not as smooth of an experience. So um, I had sent out a preview release of uh, some possible interactive console supports maybe, I don't know, about three, three, four weeks ago, and uh, it does work. 
but there are some um, some serious technical limitations to the approach that I tried. That um, even though it does work in the sort of the base case, it's not going to be a long-term solution. So I have to sort of go back to the drawing board and, and try uh, to find a better better approach. But the goal is to make VS Code feel like the ISC in the sort of really tight development feedback loop um, as you're used to, so that you basically just type some script into the editor pane and hit F8, and then it gets run into the console, and then you can go down to the console and start typing in commands. So um, I'm, I, I want that console as much as everyone else, because you know when I write PowerShell code, that's the way that I, I do it. So uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a big priority for me. Um, I feel really bad that it's taken this long to get the next update of the uh, PowerShell extension out because of all the difficulties with that. But uh, I think once we finally get past that hurdle, then most everything's going to come online. We're going to have you know remote sessions and attaching to processes and uh, I don't know. It, it will be a really good experience. I think um, there will be a lot of reasons why it, it will be it will be better than ISE in some ways and maybe not as good as ISE. But I mean it's going to be good enough that uh, that people will spend more time in it, I think. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that, because I, I enjoy working on the PowerShell extension, because VS Code just makes it so much easier for me to do really cool things, because they just have all these great APIs built in, and you know the, the uh, infrastructure they've created here is pretty nice. It's a very simple, kind of lean editor. So I don't know. It's it's uh, I, I use it all the time now, like for for writing, uh, like literally for writing. Like I've, I've been writing, you know, um, blog posts and stuff, or you know, some things that haven't been released yet. I just use VS Code for that because you know it's great for editing Markdown and um, pretty much anything that you want to do, especially other languages. So um, anyway, uh, <laughs> point is, uh, expect to see the the PowerShell extension get a lot better over the next few months, especially as we lead up to a final 1.0 release at some point next early next year. Awesome. No, I really appreciate all that information. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions for David? Hey, it looks like we're good uh, over here. I want to thank you again very much for doing this presentation, uh, answering our questions, and going over a thing. I really appreciate it when someone from the uh, actual PowerShell team takes some time out to talk to us. Of course, yeah. And, and thank you for uh, being so persistent <laughs> with, with uh, getting, getting me here, because uh, yeah, man, it's, it's difficult to find time to, to, to do uh, presentations and stuff, but I was really happy to be able to come and, uh, and speak for you guys. Awesome. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, David. Uh, we're just going to do over some uh, links and whatnot. Feel free to hang around or go about your day. I'm pretty sure it's almost close to closing time for you. Yeah, it's getting, it's getting pretty close. So I'm request control. Um, so let's see. I'll bring up a few things I want to discuss. I found it interesting along the way. Uh, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Let's see if I can present for everyone else online. So on the what? Funny enough, on the topic of um, Visual Studio Code and the uh, open source push. I'm not sure if everyone saw this, but um. Basically, one of the big things, so obviously we've discussed it multiple times on um, that PowerShell going open source and being available on like Linux, Unix, Mac OS. One of the cool things was um, earlier, maybe it was this month, um, I forget when this actually was originally posted, uh, 16 days ago actually, two weeks ago. So big surprise, one of the first things actually was there's already a version of PowerCLI that works on the core version of um, PowerShell Core, which runs in Unix.net. So the cool part about this is, um, is that for those shops running VMware who were opposed to always having a Windows box like sitting around to do all their uh, PowerCLI stuff, they can do a good majority of almost all that stuff now strictly with a Linux or Unix host running the um, PowerShell Core. Um, I'm surprised it didn't make as much big news as I thought it was. Is I was surprised at how quickly this was put together and adopted. Now, granted, it's a VMware fling. It's not officially supported. Um, but I literally cannot see this not going like crazy in the VMware community, especially um, once it's tested out and vetted. I can see this easily being put into the um, the VMware, the, what was it? it's the vCenter appliance they have now. Um, well, they've had it for a while, but it's, it's um, 
that just it's pretty much. Just, still yeah, game. I know there was a, wasn't there for the longest while like the the the, 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 the wow, I can't the words out. The Linux the, appliance version of it. The yeah, I always had a few issues, and it wasn't until like recently where they finally got to a version that was on par with the Windows installed vCenter. That's still available. Still available. Okay. So this this might be a big thing going forward. With actually, this might actually help that out and give that a bigger push. I guess it's a fling, but for any VMware guys, definitely check it out. Um, like I said, I thought this was huge news when I saw it. It is huge. Um, and I think uh, check out the Reddit post. A bunch of cool comments as well too. I'll post all these links on the summary page of this meeting. Is that the first module that you've heard of that is cross-platform? That is the published? first one I saw. And I also think it's huge because this is the first time, if I'm saying Power CLI was, was, was snap-in for the longest, PS snap-in, and they've been slowly moving some of the portions into modules. Of it, still yeah, um, actually, I forget, there was an episode of the Power Thing podcast where the lead developer on it uh, from oh, VMware mentioned like they they're that's the biggest thing they kept getting over and over again and they're slowly moving towards it just a lot of effort to rewrite all this stuff um understandably i mean the, a lot of the exchange the like exchange 2016 is still pss snap in um yeah no it's still not a full module in the sense we were loaded but, i mean they they rather you use it as for exchange rather you not even load the ps8 they, they deliberately broke stuff um in um a service pack release of 2010 and going forward they, they purposely broke certain commands the data comes over a little bit deserialized if you load the um the snap in as opposed to creating a remote se session to on the actual exchange server with the um powershell stuff already loaded you actually have the full experience um so even the exchange team has like trouble moving out of that as well um but yeah that is the only one i've seen so far I haven't. I mean, granted, like um, I haven't seen much on any blogs. Um, I haven't seen the PowerShell Reddit or um anything else. But I'm pretty sure having someone like from VMware jump on this this soon, I I'd be surprised if we don't see a lot of other major projects hop mm -hmm. over in the next year. Love to see Azure. Yeah, I'm I more than likely will probably see something SQL based by the end of the year. That well, by the end of next year, considering they they did release that version of SQL for Linux. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a full PowerShell tool set and everything set up for that within a few months. Not that I know anything, I just wouldn't be surprised. Um, one of the cool article I saw across my feed was, um, so Michael Sorens, um, I wonder if we got him, yeah, I, I almost thought we did get him to speak for us, but I really want to get him to speak for us. He, he has some really awesome in-depth articles. Um, he had a wonderful down the rabbit hole studying PowerShell pipelines, functions, and parameters. And he does a very good, um, it's this one is a, little, is a little better actually. Ins, ins and out of the pipeline. This one was the one I saw, that, let me get on to this other one. This one he recently posted, a uh, nice little one too. This one of the newer ones. These are both old articles, but recently came across this, where this gave a great explanation about how the pipeline works in all different scenarios. Um, even some stuff that it caught me off guard in regards to exactly if you're doing, let's see, a good example here. That if you're doing a lot of the nested for reaches and whatnot, um, some great examples of how that actually looks when it actually comes out and exactly how it processes. Um, like I said, it's a really, really like in-depth article and like it's some stuff that I went over. And I was like, oh, wow, I did not realize that. Um, like for example, here he's going on how like something looks with a for each without process without without using the pipeline and with the pipeline, how the data comes across. Um, basically showing here that it basically waits for one, goes to the next. While here it shoots it all out down the pipeline at once. Definitely check it out. I'll put a link to it um, in the summary post as well. And last, um, pretty sure you guys saw this, but um, next is that next week? No, two weeks. Weeks now, right? On the 14th, uh, they're doing an all-day PowerShell event. Um, Microsoft is basically a um, bunch of speakers, uh, sessions, basically celebrating the 10th anniversary of PowerShell. Uh, so definitely check that out. Uh, it's going to be on Channel 9. Um, pretty sure it's going to be just a wealth of information um, and all the other fun stuff. So 
I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I think that's all I have for links today. Um, did anyone have anything they want to discuss or go over? Or any questions?